Thank you, Johan. I appreciate uh, you setting this all up and uh, thank you very much to all the attendees, the participants. Uh, it's lovely to know that we've got a, a good audience uh, on the other side. And uh, I know most people have a little bit more time on their hands these days, but I still am most grateful for you participating and uh, making the time to learn more about uh, Trans Africa Safaris as well as the various destinations that we service. And thanks, Johan. I hope uh, all goes well on your side. You've probably got a tougher job than me in terms of moderating and keeping track of things. I just need to talk through my slides. Yes, Andre, and just uh, on that, if you have questions for anyone who's joined us later, please put them in that Q&A box. I will, uh, you know, collate them at the end and then I will pass them through to Andre to answer one by one. So feel free to reach out. You know, we want to try and keep this you know, open and flexible. We're here to help, we're here to answer questions. And uh, over to you, Andre, for walking us through there. Sure thing. All right, so um, I think Johan did uh, mention um, right up front, I'm Andre Werther, and um, I'm the Marketing and Sales Director for Trans Africa Safaris. And I probably sound a little bit similar to what Johan does. He's uh, an Americanized uh, South African, but uh, I live here in Cape Town, I'm on the ground. So yeah, just to give you a quick overview, we're gonna go through a whole bunch of slides, but just to give you a quick uh, idea as to what is contained in the presentation, a introduction to Trans Africa Safaris, the various countries that we operate in, or the countries that we service, South Africa, Botswana, Namibia, Zimbabwe, Zambia, and Mozambique. The trains, the luxury trains we have, private spaces that are becoming, or perhaps will become more and more popular moving forward. Um, and then a recap of the various highlights of the destination or the region, our documentation that we give to the clients, and also we're going to touch on payments and how we handle those. So just uh, as by way of introduction, um, certainly not wanting to sound presumptuous uh, in, any, in any way, but um, you know, we would like to put um, the clients and certainly you advisors at ease. Uh, you know, now is, is, is unprecedented times, as everybody knows. We've never been through this before. But um, we have been around for a long time. Trans Africa Safaris so started in 1918. So this year is 102 years in business. And we do have a very sound um, uh, company. We've got very good reserves. We've got uh, good fiscal disciplines, uh, good uh, reporting procedures and structures, good relationships with our bankers, uh, good cash flow. And um, you know, I think a thing that is coming to light certainly in these times when uh, there's a little bit of stress in the marketplace, we always keep your clients' money very much specifically for your clients. Um, there's no fiddling around or monkey business. We don't use them to pay other clients uh, bookings or for other purposes. Those monies are not our monies. We keep them on behalf of your clients and we use them for uh, the payment of their, their services. And then just lastly also, we've got excellent trade relationships. You know, I think giving our, our pedigree, um, We've been working with many of the suppliers we do business with today for many decades. And um, yeah, they've got our back, we've got their back. So we, we certainly have the support of um, our partners in the industry as well. Just a slide from yesteryear. Uh, this particular picture was taken in the early 50s. And um, the company was started in 1918, as I mentioned. And this uh, particular tour was known as a 55-day Congo Safari. It started in Cape Town, went all the way across South Africa into Botswana, Bechuanaland in those days, through southern Rhodesia, into northern Rhodesia, Zimbabwe and Zambia, and then into Tanganyika, and uh, ended off in Nairobi. And, uh, you know, nowadays people bumping around and bouncing around in uh, safari vehicles, they often talk about... Um, the uh, African massage, and I think certainly any clients spending 55 days bouncing around on gravel roads would have had the would have been very nice and loosened up, had a had a real um, African massage experience. So that's just a fun picture, a little bit of colour. All uh, our extended family, as I mentioned, uh, it's a family business. Not everybody in the in the picture is is in the business, but um, we are a family. Um, we spend a lot of time together as a family. We're a close-knit family. We uh, travel together 
both locally and abroad as a family. And we certainly believe, you know, in terms of family travel, we are well equipped to provide your clients with an amazing experience. We, we know what clients like, we know what works. Um, so yeah, just in terms of family, we'll go through some of the, the key players uh, in the company on the next slide. Um, so my late father-in-law, uh, Brian Patterson, he, he's got three sisters, three sisters, he's got three daughters. They all active in the business um, today and a lot of experience, you know, from retail and uh, more recently, certainly in the last 25 years, it's all been um, uh, Trans Africa Safaris on the uh, inbound side. But a lot of experience within the top management team. We've got uh, also within our uh, extended staff complement, tremendous amount of experience. And we only work with um, travel agents. We don't do any wholesale business. We used to many years back provide services for some of the, um, the US um, tour operators. But today we really focus and specialize on retail travel business. And by the same token, we don't operate, um, do any direct business. You know, if somebody comes to us by an unrelated uh, avenue, we'll certainly assist them. We've got friends and, uh, and uh, indirect colleagues um, living abroad, and sometimes we get a request, but we don't, we don't um, pursue direct business as such. So we've got a website, but it really is there to provide a, a shop window to you and your clients to see what we provide and how we operate and the various choices that are out there. And then lastly, um, you know, I think especially now in times like this, uh, one understands the importance of having somebody on the ground um, with a good pedigree to help and assist with all these ever-changing environments. You know, the, the landscape is changing on a, a weekly basis. Um, many of the suppliers that we work with have certainly changed their, their terms and conditions, and we are there to provide you with a cohesive and um, understandable um, explanation for what is happening, whether you've got an existing booking or whether you come through to us with a new request. So there you see um, our, our various staff. Um, Jennifer in the top left is the managing director and her two sisters are Beverly and Leslie. And Janice on the, uh, the right hand side up here, top right. Some of you may know her as well. She was previously with uh, the Belmont Mount Nelson and she joined us beginning of last year and um, is our ops, op, op, operations uh, manager. And then also uh, going on to the second line of staff members, Michael is Jennifer's son, and uh, he's the third generation of Pattersons in the family. Um, Mara and Michelle are both um, senior consultants. So we've got a nice team that really works well together. We all based in the Cape Town office, and I think we really do box well above our weight. You know, we. Um, we work hard, we have fun together, but we certainly make sure that we are providing you and your clients with um, everything that they need. So just in terms of uh, what we think uh, are different, differentiating um, uh, qualities, uh, the first one is you know, we do have a lot of very experienced and senior people in the organization. A lot of the, um, in fact, all the owners are involved in um, in the quote requests that uh, are sent in to us. Um, Jennifer, less so from a running the business um, aspect, but um, Beverly, Beverly and Leslie, uh, daily they're involved in both um, predominantly FITs, but also in small group requests. And then also, you know, the fact that we are independent, I think is something that uh, we believe stands us in good stead. We work with a wide variety of, of different partners, different properties, hotels and lodges, but we're not locked into any specific um, entity. We will always give you our objective, um, um, honest opinion as to what we think is going to work best for your particular clients. And then also, you know, we work and collaborate with you. Um, we can't obviously know everything about your client up front. We rely on you to feed through to us what they like, if they've perhaps been to Africa before, where they've, where they've visited, if they haven't been to Africa, the sort of holidays and experiences that they've enjoyed in other destinations, 
and then we will work with you to come up with an itinerary that's going to be perfect for those particular clients. So it's not a cookie cutter approach. You know, we're quite happy to spend several days to and fro coming up with um, a program that's going to be uh, just right for your particular clients. And then also, um, you know, the high touch personalized aspect of uh, the company. You know, we are small, we are boutique, and we really, as I said, we spend time to ensure that what we are giving to you to pass on to your clients is, is going to be right for them. And we're very happy also to have um, conference calls with you and your clients. Oftentimes, you know, the clients or well, the agent might say, look, uh, you speak directly to the client and uh, sort it out and keep me in the loop. And we, we're happy to do that as well. And then um, during the course of your client's travels, we in contact with them throughout their trip. We don't badger them every day and find out uh, what's going on. But we certainly stay in contact with them. We welcome them on arrival. We speak to them uh, once or twice during, uh, during the, the, um, the trip that they're taking. And we also feed back through to your soul. So you know, by the time they return home, we've said goodbye to them. We've found out how their trip was. We give you um, input and feedback as well. So you're not getting any surprises from your clients when, they, when you pick up the phone and speak to them when they're back um, on US soil. And then, you know, we really do strive to be very timely, as quick in terms of our responses. Within 24 hours, unless it's a complicated request, we certainly will send you a detailed, comprehensive proposal. And um, another thing that I think a lot of our agents, certainly the clients themselves, do comment on is the fact that we've got very nice coffee table, memento type of uh, documentation. Things that you can put out on your table and show your, your friends and visitors to your home and uh, we'll go take a closer look at that towards the end of the presentation. Commission payments, um, you know, at the moment uh, we request final payment 60 days prior to the arrival of the clients and um, at that time if it is a gross quote that we provided you, we then send you your commission as a, as a wire transfer in US dollars. So you're getting your Commission, you know, way up front, and I think that's quite unique with certainly a lot of uh, other companies uh, in this part of the world. And uh, always nice to to have the monies in your hands. And and definitely, if uh, any supplementary services are requested while they um, in 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 the country or in the region, we will protect you with commission on that as well, and we'll send you a a follow up uh, payment later. And then, of course, uh, we've got Johan. Um, he's based in Boulder in Colorado, and he's our man on the ground. He's uh, ex-South African, as I mentioned up front. Um, he's uh, got extensive uh, experience in the industry. He's got extensive product knowledge. Him and his, his dear wife, Brooke, they travel not only uh, the African continent, they've been to other far-flung places, I mean, Sri Lanka and Madagascar, and they really they have a, a penchant for, for travel and adventure and for finding these little hidden gems. So your hands on the ground, if you've got a, a client request, um, you know, sometimes it's easier if uh, our office is closed to pick up the phone. These contact details, I think many of you will have. Um, certainly they're on our website and they're on the various um, consortia sites that we, we uh, um, are partners of as well. And yeah, great starting point, you know, especially sometimes if the clients don't know where they want to go or what they want to do, to have a conversation with your hand and to try and um, narrow down and focus on what is going to be best for those specific clients. Okay, so we don't have any um, pink zebra in the country, so you're not um, seeing things, but um, the idea behind this particular slide is really just to convey you know, we work with you. It's, um, it's, as I said, it's a collaborative exercise. We will spend time to create a, a program, a trip that's going to be unique and special for your clients. And we really do want your clients to stand out uh, and have an exceptional experience, stand out from the herd and feel like they've been doted over and had special uh, attention paid to them. And then again, you know, a lot of people will say certainly uh, um, a picture tells a thousand words. And I think this particular slide uh, we like because they're you know, like the mother elephant protecting the baby. We feel, in a sense, um, that is our role in this equation. 
We're based in country, we're here. Um, you know, if anything goes wrong, we would pick it up in advance if there's a flight change. Um, but if somebody loses a bag or they don't like their room or they don't like their guide or they, don't, uh, they get sick, heaven forbid, we there, we really are an extension of your, your office and your services. And we are happy to provide you know, a very comprehensive service in that respect. Okay, the idea with the slide is really just to say, you know, we, as I mentioned, we don't own any properties. We work with a broad spectrum of, of partners, hotels, lodges, trains, um, airlines, charter, uh, air companies. And, you know, we, I think strangely for some people, we have a very good relationship with our competitors as well. We see a lot of our uh, competitors as, as very dear partners, we work with them, they have uh, lodges, they've got the properties that we book, and um, we get heavily discounted rates from all our partners. So, you know, whether you're booking a wilderness lodge or whether you're booking and beyond or Sanctuary or Great Plains, Belmont, uh, St. Gita, um, you know, more properties, you're always, you're never going to pay more working through us than you would going directly to those partners. And of course, we are here to manage the entire process, to put it all together and um, ensure that nothing goes wrong and to you know, ensure that nothing falls through the cracks and your clients have a seamless and wonderful holiday. Right, so moving on to the map, um, we've got a, it's an extensive area, you know, we're based in Cape Town, South Africa, but we, we really do cover a big uh, uh, part of the continent. Well, there's a lot of the continent we don't cover, but uh, the area that we're going to be focusing on today is um, my cursor, you know, South Africa, all the way up into the Kruger Park, Botswana, the Okavango Delta, Namibia, Zimbabwe, Zambia. For the most part, we we spend a lot of time in uh, in Victoria Falls area, and then also Mozambique. But we'll go into those different areas in more detail. Um, Keeping an eye on the clock there. Yeah, so Cape Town um, is an area a lot of clients either arrive or finish their trip in, and certainly it is a beautiful destination. You know, a lot of natural beauty uh, with the mountains, the beaches, um, the botanical gardens. Um, and then on our doorstep, we have um, the Winelands. And um, these, this particular map, that certainly you can access it online and download it, but we also have hard copies that we can. Johanna has a supply, so we can send to you if you'd like to have a, a copy in your office. And it shows not very nicely, you know, where the different hotels and lodges that we work with on a regular basis are located. And Cape Town, as I say, great amount of attractions, you know, uh, lots of things to do. It's a very cosmopolitan city, very beautiful. Um, a lot of clients will come for uh, four nights, perhaps five nights, and spend that in Cape Town. But many of our clients do three nights Cape Town and then go through to the Winelands um, for two nights. That also makes for a lovely itinerary. And, um, you know, June, and, June through to September are traditionally quite busy because it's the high season for safari. But, um, and obviously the festive season also tends to get really busy. But the, our summertime, February, January, February through to April, is a lovely time to visit. You know, it's, the weather is, is magnificent in this area and the less people oftentimes and the rates are more attractive at that time of the year as well. And a lot of things to do, you know, you can go into the winelands, you can go down to Cape Point, you can go into Kirstenbosch, Robben Island, you can do a lot of soft adventure activities. You want to go walking up Table Mountain, if you want to go um, horse riding in the winelands, if you want to go um, riding bicycles in Cape Point or, um, you know, out in the wine country, there are many things that one can do. Diving, um, in, in Pulse Bay or diving around Hart Bay, lots of activities. And they also further appeal, the clients have the time, you know, we've got Hermanus, which is about an hour and a half away, um, traveling southeast, and um, beautiful hotels right on the, on the beach, and, um, and then further up the west coast, we have Cedarburg, which has got some very nice uh, lodges in that area as well. So that's a picture of uh, the Cape Point, the Cape Peninsula, and many people, most people visiting Cape Town would certainly include that as a data. Very scenically beautiful, 
Um, it's known as the southwesternmost point uh, um, of the African continent. And this, in this area, your, the Atlantic and the Indian Oceans uh, come together. So oftentimes uh, around our summer season, you know, the, the seas get pretty rough, but really is very beautiful. You've got some lovely stops on route, um, stopping off in, at Boulders Beach in Simonstown and seeing the penguins, you know, going back to uh, the city, you can travel over Chapman's Peak and um, it really is a spectacular day trip. And then um, traveling out to the Winelands, you know, you've got many options. You can do uh, Winelands visits in, um, in Paul, you can go to Franschhoek, you can go to Stellenbosch, you can go out to close to the Manus, there's some beautiful estates, but it really, there's a lot of scenic beauty. You know, you've got uh, traditional Cape Dutch architecture, you've got um, some lovely little restaurants, um, boutique hotels, you've got uh, um, art galleries, you've got um, antique stores, so lots to do and see in this part of the world. But for most people, you know, to visit um, one day, visit uh, some of the wineries and see some of the sites and then perhaps to spend the second day just relaxing and taking in um, the surrounding areas. Okay, um, perhaps not for everyone, but uh, certainly surprisingly sometimes for us, I think uh, we do get quite a lot of requests. People want to see uh, what's lurking under the under the seas and um, you know, clients want to go and do the great white uh, shark edge diving. You can do it um, in close proximity to Cape Town in Pulse Bay, but most often the best experiences tend to be in the, our winter, so anytime from about May through to October. And um, you travel just beyond the Manus, there's an area known as uh, Hans Bay, Hans is a geese, so it'll translate to goose or geese, geese bay in English. And uh, there you get really good um, uh, shark encounters. And at the same time, you know, you'll see seals. Oftentimes you'll see whales in season, um, dolphins, etc., as well. All right, so moving on to one of the other um, key attractions. Um, you know, a lot of first-time visitors obviously want to uh, experience a good safari experience, and um, certainly the Greater Kruger Park area offers this. You know. Um, this area where number one is highlighted, um, that is an area known as the Savi Sand Gay Reserve. And we blow that uh, little section out into this bigger map so you can see where all the popular lodges that we commonly book are. So places like Mala Mala, Sagita, Lion Sands, Lusava, um, Londolozi. You know, there are many different properties, Savi Savi, and um, the area is, 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 is very good in terms of its, um, its big five densities. You've got a lot of, um, because of the fact that there are two rivers, you've got the Sand River and the Sabi River, a lot of water, a good concentrations of game, um, um, uh, prey species in the area, and then of course that attracts all the predators. But um, moving further to the north, where number two is, you also have an area known as the Manyaleti Game Reserve. And again, not as many lodges in that area, and this Saudi sand area measures about um, 300,000 acres. So it's, you know, it's not a big area, it's about 125,000 hectares, but um, as I say, you know, very good in terms of uh, their big five concentrations. So going up into the Manyaleti, you've got some very nice lodges in that area as well, places like uh, some Swallow, you've got Honey Guide, and you know, less traffic, um, but also some wonderful wildlife opportunities. And then further to the north, You've got um, you've got an area known as the Thorny Bush um, Game Reserve, and to the east of that you've got the Timbavati. And these also places like um, Thorny Bush Game Lodge itself. Um, um, you've got uh, Royal Malawan, which should be familiar to many of you. You've got Camp Jabalani. You've got King's Camp. So there's some excellent uh, safari experiences um, further up north into that uh, Thorny Bush. Um, uh, Timbavati area. Okay, so for a lot of people, you know, you can certainly fly quite comfortably from Cape Town into Nelspreet uh, or into Skakuza, and then you can either do a road transfer or a quick um, light aircraft transfer into the game lodge where you're staying. But a lot of clients uh, are in Johannesburg and uh, they will fly from Johannesburg uh, via one of the 
um, the scheduled charter companies um, that offer a seat rates straight into the lodge of their choosing. So you can fly to Johannesburg, hour, hour 20 minutes later, be at um, Sugito or be at Londolosi or at your lodge of choice. So it's a nice quick way of getting from uh, the city straight into the safari areas. And then, um, you know, a lot of the lodges take uh, children of any ages, and um, some of them have minimums of eight years, some have minimums of 10, 12 years. But I think it really is, you know, it's a fantastic experience to be on safari with your family, whether it's a multi-generational family with the grandparents, their kids, and the grandkids. We get a lot of trips where um, you've got grandparents traveling with uh, the grandchildren. You've got uncle or an aunt taking their nephew or their niece on a holiday. And I think it really just is something quite uh, special to be on safari, you know, to be doing new things, experiencing all these uh, wonderful um, adventures as a family. Um, it's a great time to bond. You've got, um, you've got expert guides, you've got trackers, and you're learning a lot. So we find that uh, you know, family travel is, is certainly something that is, is popular, and I think more so given the times that we live in, you know, I think people are, are going to be shaken by this uh, pandemic we've, we're, we've, we're experiencing at the moment, and they want to look for quality experiences and quality time with their family. And we spoke about the big five. Um, this is a shot taken um, at Mala Mala Game Lunch, and um, yeah, you just get a sense of how close one can get to um, these big animals. Uh, yeah, you've got a herd of buffalo, but you really get, you know, a couple of meters away from elephant, lion, um, leopard, rhino, giraffe, hippo. Um, so it really is quality uh, safari experience. A great photographic opportunity. Just a quick look at some of the accommodations. This particular lodge is Sahita Labombo, which is actually outside of the uh, Sabi Sanders uh, different areas that I showed you. It's actually in the Kruger Park itself, and uh, there are certain private concessions uh, in the Kruger. You've got um, uh, more properties, uh, Lion Sands, you've got uh, Tinga and Arena, which is just outside of Skakuza. You've got uh, Jock Safari Camp, you've got um, Sangita La Bomba and Sweeney. So those are options as well for your clients visiting uh, this greater Kruger Park area. All right, so. Um, sip of water. Um, moving up into Botswana, and you know, Botswana is a fantastic safari destination. You've got um, wonderful reserves, you've got uh, outstanding wildlife, it's a very pristine wilderness area. You've got a um, you know, very low density of, of traffic, uh, human uh, footprints in a lot of these areas. And the key areas are obviously, I think everybody would have certainly heard of the Okavanga Delta, which is that big um, finger, if you want to call it, as the Okavanga River sort of enters into northern Botswana and starts to spread out into the Kalahari Sands, it forms this delta. So that's the bigger area. Within that, you have uh, the Miremi Game Reserve, where a lot of the well known properties. Um, exist and uh, very good concentrations of, of wildlife in that area. And then you've got further to the northeast, you've got the Cylinder, Lanyanti, Kwando area, where again, you know, uh, good, fantastic sightings, uh, good lodges, beautiful properties, um, and uh, lovely activities on hand. And then behind my head, uh, you've got the Chobe National Park area where You've got fantastically large concentrations of big herds. You get a lot of elephant in that area, a lot of big herds of zebra and buffalo, um, wildebeest. So, and then down in the south, not forgetting the Makhari Khari Pans, you've got um, a couple of very nice lodges, again, offering a different experience. A lot of it is, um, is, is very barren uh, landscape, these, uh, these salt pans. And then further to the south, which you don't really see on my map, you've got the central Kalahari area. But Botswana really complements, as I said, uh, other areas of Southern Africa fantastically because you've got the water element. You've got a lot of camps that are predominantly in land, fixed 
land areas, and then you also have camps that are predominantly water camps. So you get exposure to all the different activities. You can do water activities, you can do full work or game drives. Some of the camps offer helicopter flights, ballooning, you can do boating, you can do um, dugouts, these little canoes. So it really gives you a very different uh, type of experience from what you're going to be getting um, in some of the South Africa or certainly going into Namibia, um, Zimbabwe, Zambia areas. And there you can just get a, a sense of the isolation, the beautiful surroundings. You really, you don't have, you know, people bugging you. You've got uh, your own little uh, piece of nature all to yourself. This particular picture is of uh, Mambo, which a lot of you would be familiar with. And um, yeah, it's really got an iconic uh, reputation uh, based on uh, Chief's Island in the Marebi Game Reserve. You know, I think I did mention, but um, some of the, the properties um, in Southern Africa have become expensive, you know. Uh, you're choosing the top tier of accommodation, the top lodges, you're gonna be paying 2,000 to and a half, 3,000 plus per person per night. So they are pricey and you're paying obviously for a great experience, but um, there are many less expensive options as well. Some very affordable uh, lodges um, and camps that offer you a very good safari experience. So yeah, depending on the client's budget, one can definitely pick and choose the lodge for your specific clients. So pretty shot of a, a leopard. And then, as I mentioned, you know, um, I think the beauty of Botswana is ideally if clients uh, have got four days on hand or five days on hand, they could do perhaps three nights at a, at a land camp, do all the uh, terrestrial activities and see all the big game and see all the big herds and then spend two nights at a, at a water camp. And sometimes that's the better sequence of doing things if it's your first safari stop. To get all the big, uh, the big attractions, the big uh, animals that you tick off your list done, and then you can go into some of the water areas and um, you know, enjoy the water animals, the birds, the crocs, and the hippos. But there also are many um, combination camps, as they call them, camps that offer both land and water experiences. So perhaps if you press what, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I think I swallowed <coughs> a little fly. <coughs> Okay, so if you press for time, you can do one of these combination camps where in the morning you might um, go on a four by four game drive, and in the afternoon you can, uh, <coughs> excuse me, you can do your water activities. You can go on a boat trip or you can do a, a, a pontoon, a sunset um, uh, trip on the, on the Delta waterways, on the, on the uh, lagoons, and uh, also do the, the dugouts, the canoe trips. So important to remember that they've got the, the great diversity of different experiences, land and water. Right, so looking at uh, Namibia, um, you know, very different destination. Perhaps most first time visitors won't have the time to do it, but certainly if you've, if you've got three weeks perhaps, because you really need um, a week to do justice to Namibia. They, if you do, three areas, you know, three nights, two or three nights a piece, um, you're gonna be looking at a week uh, plus. And um, the key areas one should look to consider for an itinerary are this area down in the south known as uh, Sasses Flay, where you get some spectacular scenery. You've got a lot of, um, a lot of it is desert, a lot of it is arid, a lot of it is remote and isolated, but I think that is the beauty of the place. You've got, very few people, you've got, um, you know, if you live in a big city, if you live uh, in Chicago or New York, in LA, and you just want to escape the crowds and have a lot of good headspace and time to relax and enjoy the night skies and enjoy peace and tranquility, this is a wonderful destination to do that. So in the south there, you've got uh, Sussex Flay, where you've got a lot of the, um, the big dunes. Um, Dune 45 is, is one of the biggest dunes in the world. And then moving up to the north, you've got an area known as Demoraland, where a lot of you will be familiar with um, a lot of the desert adapted animals. You've got desert, uh, desert elephant, you've got desert rhino, you've got desert uh, lion. Um, so, you know, it's a barren area, but you certainly do have wildlife. I and mean, then going up into the Tasha 
Um, a lot of the lodges that we work with are on the um, the outside, just on the perimeter of the, the national park itself, but you've got some very good uh, accommodation options um, in that Itasha area. And here you've got fantastic wildlife. You know, not the big five. They don't have buffalo in um, in um, Namibia, but you'll see good quantities of oryx. You'll see springbuck. You'll see zebra. You'll see elephant. You'll see lion. On occasion, you might be lucky and you see leopard. You can see cheetah. So very good wildlife uh, concentrations in that area. And then just lastly, moving up to the north, um, you've got an area known, or an area off the skeleton coast known as Seracathema. Uh, it's a wilderness safaris lodge. And it really is something spectacular. I'll show you a few images of that later. And then of course, the skeleton coast itself, which is the area on the, on the west, western side of the country, which uh, again, is a, a, is a very um, worthwhile visit and interesting attraction. And then just off to the side uh, is actually my wife, Leslie. We were up in Seracatima last year in April and um, spending a bit of time with the local tribes there. And, you know, a lot of people visiting our country, and I might as well just touch on it while I've got the slide um, on screen. You know, whether you're in Cape Town or whether you're on safari, um, we are a part of the um, Pack for a Purpose initiative. The clients want to visit and see the other side of life, you know, go into a community area, visit a school, visit a village. Those kind of things are certainly um, activities that we can organize. And for, for adults, but certainly for kids, I think it's very, um, very worthwhile uh, to show them the, the local side of life when they're visiting these countries. And, you know, there's certainly no um, pressure on, on guests to dig into their pocket and to make donations, but many, many clients do. And I think nowadays, um, especially, you know, under this, uh, these current circumstances, we've seen the great divergence and the great um, need between the haves and the have nots. And, you know, many of these people uh, do have great needs. So just getting back to some of the, the beautiful photographs and um, the topography that one can experience, you get a lot of beautiful uh, scenery in this in this area of Namibia. This is um, flying over the southern part of Namibia, and then an area, the area known as Damaraland, where I mentioned you've got the desert elephants. Very healthy uh, cheetah populations in Namibia. Um, good strong gene pools. So animals are doing well uh, in this part of the, the country. And then this is a shot taken up at Seracatima, which is this lodge right up against the uh, uh, Kadeni River on the Angolan border. And, you know, it really is stunning. I mean, you'll, not perhaps for everyone, but I think, uh, you know, people that appreciate uh, photography and nature and um, just some different landscapes, you'll find things there that uh, you'll see no, nowhere else, certainly in Africa. And then it's not only about uh, all the big uh, animals and the big predators. Yeah, you've got a little gecko running around on the sand. It looks very much like your your Geico, the insurance company in the States. And here, a picture, obviously, from above, um, flying over the skeleton coast. So it just shows you, gives an appreciation of what you can expect in the middle. Right, so moving on to uh, Zambia and Zimbabwe. You know, for a lot of our guests, it tends to be um, about the falls area. Um, Certainly, if clients have the time or if they visited uh, the falls and don't need to go back, you can go into Kafui, you can go into North and South Luangwa, you can go into uh, Zambezi, uh, the Lower Zambezi National Park, you can go into Mana Pools area, you can go into Wangi. But for a lot of um, first time visitors, they, they will be looking to spend two nights. And two nights really is sufficient. You can cover the, the falls quite adequately with that. And, there's a good choice of accommodations in terms of bigger lodges, um, smaller properties. You've got big hotels like uh, the Victoria Falls Hotel, the Royal Livingston. You know, sometimes the clients have been on safari. Perhaps they want to enjoy the uh, amenities of a hotel. And then obviously those options are there for them. But there's some fantastic smaller properties scattered all along the, the length of the river. Excuse me. Just on the little fly that I've had in my mouth. Okay, so looking at um, 
the Zambezi River and the falls and cells. It uh, really is a spectacular site. And this is a, a picture taken, obviously, in high flood, um, which is around about now. The falls uh, at the moment are very impressive. You've got um, almost a kilometre um, in, in width of the face of the falls. But they do vary quite significantly from um, different periods of the year. So from April through to about August, they in pretty high, uh, high, high volume, full flood, and then they start to get get lower and lower water densities all the way through to the summer season, coming into October through to December. And some of you might be aware, you know, there was some footage uh, on various of the, the TV stations around December last year showing the falls as apparently completely dried up, which wasn't 100% accurate. There was still a reasonable amount of water coming over the falls. But you need to just be cognizant of the, the time of the year you visit. It. You know, each one has its, uh, has its strength in terms of visiting the area. Um, and it really is uh, the adventure capital of of the region. Um, you've got a lot of adventure activities from whitewater rafting, you can do uh, bungee jumping, you can do zip lining, you can do uh, kayaking above the falls, you can do microlights, you can do uh, flights over the falls. And many of our clients, you know, they, they really, we recommend that they do a, a flight, what is called the flight of the angels, and you get into a fixed wing or a helicopter and you fly over the falls and you get a, an aerial perspective of it, which gives you a full appreciation of the extent of the, the waterfalls themselves. And just in the right hand side, you've got uh, a very deluxe houseboat, which we sell as well, known as uh, the Zambezi Queen. And that is about two hours drive uh, west, going into Botswana on the Toby River, but certainly in close proximity to the falls themselves. Right, and uh, some of you might, may have seen this little picture before, but um, certainly not the one with uh, Johan and Brook. Um, there's our man with the sunglasses on and Brooke. So from uh, the Zambian side, you can take uh, a boat and you go to um, uh, Livingston Island. And then from there, yeah, any time when the falls start to, um, to get low, so from about October all the way through to January, you could actually walk and wade your way from the little island to Devil's Pool. And if you're brave enough, you can go and swim right on the edge of the falls. And as I mentioned, um, you know, a lot of choices in terms of uh, lodges, um, bigger hotels. This particular property is um, Tonga Beezy's sister property known as Cinder Beezy. It's uh, located right in the middle of the Zambezi River. So, you know, you've got intimate surroundings. You've got the water right at your doorstep, but the lodge, um, the rooms are elevated. You don't have any, anything uh, un unwanted coming to visit you during the middle of the night. Okay, and just uh, getting towards the end of it, um, you know, we also have uh, very nice, uh, two very nice trains operating in our, our country. Um, a blue train, obviously the blue one, and then Rovos Rail. And the main routing for both trains is, is Cape Town, Pretoria, or uh, vice versa. They, they don't operate daily, so one needs to check the schedule in terms of uh, the different journeys that they offer. And they're both two night um, excursions. Um, the blue train used to be a, a single night journey between Cape Town and Victoria, but it's now moved to a two night trip. And they both offer a very good product. You know, the blue train is slightly more modern in terms of the, uh, the train, the suites, um, slightly more comfortable suspension perhaps, but they, they both have very good accommodations, on, on suite facilities, air conditioning, you've got private butlers, you've got off train excursions. Blue Train very occasionally operates a routing through from Pretoria to Hutzbreit into the Kruger Park area. And then Robust Rail has quite a few other itineraries as well where they travel from um, Cape Town uh, all the way through to um, up into um, the Dar es Salaam. They've got a routing that travels from Pretoria through to Namibia, Walters Bay, and they've got yeah, quite a few very interesting longer trips. But if you've got clients that have enjoyed rail travel, if they've done any of the Orient Express trains they've done, perhaps the Royal Scotsman or the Rocky Mountaineer in Canada, they may well be good candidates for our, our luxury trains. And then uh, another option certainly, you know, for um, families, uh, for honeymooners, if they're looking to just relax at the end of their trip, perhaps spend a couple of nights 
on the beach. We've got some very nice resorts, uh, accommodations on the coast of Mozambique. And um, yeah, I mean, that's not perhaps for everyone. I mean, you've got fantastic uh, options on your side as well, but if you've got, as I say, families that want to just do water activities, do fishing, uh, do snorkeling, chill, um, spend time on the beach, you've got some very nice uh, options. Um, right close to Johannesburg, you can even fly from uh, Nelspreet into Villanculus, and then you're right there in the area of um, uh, the Bazaruta Archipelago, where a lot of these uh, lodges are based. And the very nice option is to combine um, Cape Town, Safari, and the beach. So, you know, if you've got a family or a honeymoon that's looking for that kind of itinerary, that uh, makes for a very nice program. All right, so just wrapping up, um, you know, we've got, uh, I think now especially, there's, uh, and coming when, when business picks up again, and the recovery starts and people start moving around and traveling, I think we are going to see a, um, a demand for staying somewhat secluded from um, the masses. And we've got a great many uh, very nice private options. We've got private villas, you've got uh, manor houses, you've got smaller properties that one can take exclusive use of. So, you know, really perfect for families and friends that want to keep to themselves and not to be exposed perhaps to uh, bigger, bigger masses of people. And you can find those in all the different uh, areas that we operate, you know, whether it's South Africa or going to Namibia or going to um, up into Botswana, uh, Vic Falls area and um, yeah, put together a nice program. Obviously, they they will be for people that have the budgets, but again, you know, for folk that are celebrating a, a anniversary, a birthday, um, you know, child's graduation, you can put together a lovely sequence of properties. And then just quickly a recap of, um, you know, some of the highlights of the area. We've gone through quite a lot, but, you know, Keep in mind, it is a diverse offering. This area, the Southern Africa area that we've, we've, we've spoken about, there really is something for everyone. You know, if you've got clients that want safari only, if you've got clients that are more interested in cultural experiences, if they're more interested in art and history, if they want um, golf, if they want uh, food and wine activities, there's really a lot to offer them. And right now, um, the uh, South African exchange rate is, uh, is likely for Foreign visitors is, is weak. Um, you know, in the, since January, we've moved from about 14 Rand to the dollar to around 19 Rand to the dollar. So, you know, there really is exceptionally good value in South Africa. The neighboring countries are priced in US dollars, so you don't see the benefit quite as much, but um, in South Africa itself, um, a great rate of exchange and very, very affordable um, uh, buying opportunities. And then, as I said before, you know, we cater anything from mid-range all the way through to deluxe. And we will pick and choose um, properties that we that will cater to those specific budgets. Um, we didn't speak a lot about uh, um, malaria-free areas, but, you know, if you have clients that may be a family or if you've got a, a mother who's uh, expecting to be pregnant or might be pregnant, you've got places in the Eastern Cape, you've got... Uh, Areas in the Northern Cape around Swalu, which is a beautiful area, which is an area for you can go up to Madikwe. So, you know, one can explore those uh, opportunities as well. Uh, I think East, uh, Southern Africa people often feel comfortable visiting as a first time um, Africa trip because, you know, the access is, is good. The air access in and around uh, Southern Africa is good. And we've got good infrastructure. You know, heaven forbid you need uh, a hospital or, um, you know, you've got fantastic hotels and lodges. We've got delicious food and wine. We've got um, a lot of people, you ask them what they loved about their trip and they'll tell you the local hospitality, you know, meeting the locals, spending time with them, seeing how they live and experiencing um, their life. And then just lastly, also keep in mind, you know, we do not the, the full um, uh, cruise ship uh, movements, but we do a lot of private shore excursions and certainly pre and post trips. And if your clients are taking a cruise and they're getting off, um, you know, perhaps in Cape Town or starting their the cruise uh, in Cape Town, let them spend a bit of time in that area. Uh, can, from Cape Town, you can get to all the key um, areas. Okay, and then just looking quickly at our, um, our documentation, we've got uh, very nice documentation. As I say, you know, a little um, booklet on the left-hand side, it would contain your itinerary, day-to-day -day itinerary with all the information you need to know, uh, all the contact information we send you 
good email documentation ahead of time. Um, so you've got all the pictures, all the links, and then when your clients arrive, we give them a, a, a hard copy of, of the itinerary. And that is comes in a nice uh, little folder, which you can use later as a iPad cover if you so wish. We give them um, nice leather um, bag tags, and then we also give them a bag. Um, the current bag has got wheels, so it's easy to maneuver and, and, and get around. And uh, that is perfect for your light aircraft transfers, where you limit to 44 pounds of baggage. Just looking at um, the uh, the details regarding payments, you know, normally we would we would quote you a net price. We give you two prices. The one price is uh, allows for payment by a credit card, and the second price is is a discounted price for payment by wire transfer. But certainly, if you prefer gross pricing, you know, you tell us up front uh, or tell us after you receive the net price, and we we clearly indicate to you the way it is costed. Um, we're very happy to give you a gross price and we will guide you also in terms of uh, a commission that um, is, is manageable on the particular program. But uh, some of you will, will no doubt be familiar with PayPal and that's also becoming increasingly popular, especially if um, the, it's a card payment, um, they can do payment um, using their credit card, we send them a link. And uh, if it's predominantly dollars, PayPal works out to be a good avenue because uh, we can keep the the, um, the dollars in dollars, whereas if we, if we charge the card in South Africa, um, we charge it in rand and then have to buy the dollars back again. All right, so that's uh, really a wrap of uh, our little uh, presentation for today. And um, you know, please, uh, we, we're going to have some question time now. But if any of you want uh, sample itineraries, or if you have any questions that you don't want to uh, submit right now. Send them through to our res email, which is given on the screen there, res at transafricasafaris.com. And I'd be more than happy to answer those uh, for you. But again, thank you very much for your time. It's greatly appreciated. And I hope uh, you found something interesting in this presentation. Thank you, Andre. Thank you for that uh, beautiful overview of Southern Africa. And if any of you have questions, <laughs> please type them in the Q&A little box. Uh, a few of those have come through uh, already. So uh, we can answer those as they come in. Uh, Andre, one of the questions was uh, to kind of go a little bit more into the, the major malaria-free areas, um, where obviously if you're going to Southern Africa, typically malaria is the only medical, major medical precaution to uh, look at, or that's uh, required in some areas, but uh, just kind of highlight maybe on the map uh, where the major malaria-free areas are that uh, we work with. Sure, absolutely. So, you know, the map, unfortunately, if it was interactive, I could, uh, I could zoom in. But uh, if you see where the cursor is um, off to uh, north of, north of, uh, of Pretoria, there's a, it's in the region, uh, not too far from um, um, Sun City, a little bit, a little bit to the west of uh, that uh, Sun City area. You've got a reserve known as the Dikwe, where you've got a, a good selection of properties, both in terms of mid-range um, and certainly some very deluxe uh, op options as well. And that's a very nice malaria-free area. You've got um, other regions, you know, the whole of Namibia is malaria-free, so if you've got clients traveling into that part of the world, they can certainly do some good safari. Um, the area around um, uh, Maputo land, you know, places like Pinda, you've got Tanda Game Reserve, you know, the incidence of malaria there is incredibly remote, but it is, it is regarded as a low malaria area. So that's a possible option. And then certainly down in the east, um, Eastern Cape area, become very um, popular, perhaps not yet for the American market, but uh, you've got a, a great assortment of wonderful properties there. You know, you've got places like Shamwari, you've got Kwandwe, you've got um, Samara, you've got uh, Lalibela, um, Karika. So there are very many good options. And, you know, they, they didn't all used to be um, big five uh, game, game lodges, or game reserves, but nowadays um, you can certainly see the big five in this area. So, you know, those are, are, are good areas to consider um, for malaria-free uh, safari. 
And then we have a question uh, on what areas are specifically good for families. And, you know, in my experience, obviously, the malaria-free areas quite often come in play when you're looking at youngsters. But are there any of the areas that's more friendly and less friendly towards children? You know, from my side, I know, for instance, Botswana doesn't have as many family options as, let's say, South Africa would have. Yes, no, exactly. You know, I think, um, I mean, certainly uh, Cape Town and the surrounding area, you've got some fantastic things that you can do with kids, you know. Uh, you've got um, wonderful excursions. Um, um, you can... Uh, you can go out to Hermanus area, you can go, um, there's a lodge in that area known as, uh, as Krotbos, which is very um, family friendly. You've got uh, fantastic be uh, beach options in that area. You've got um, nature walks, um, those kind of activities. You can do whale watching, you can, you've got the shark cage operation close by. But then as you say, I think um, uh, the Kruger area is very well equipped. You know, you've got a lot of lodges there that have got um, um, family programs for, for young kids. You know, oftentimes it's a good, a good uh, uh, idea to take um, uh, exclusive use of the game vehicle. And then you can, you know, provided the, uh, the lodge itself allows kids of any age, you can, you can do what you want. Uh, you're not imposing on any of the other guests. And um, I think most families tend to be five, six, seven people, and then it makes, it makes great sense to have the safari vehicle to yourself. But they've got a lot of um, um, interleading options, interleading rooms. They've got uh, um, family units where you've got two, two, three bedroom units. So they would be very well suited to families traveling together. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, um, even going up into, up into uh, Vic Falls area, you can find some very nice uh, family accommodations uh, in that part of the world as well. Fantastic. And, and I always like that Vic Falls area for, especially when you have teenagers and young adults as well, because of all those adventure activities, get you out of the vehicle a little bit and, you know, scare your parents with a bungee jump or some whitewater rafting or something like that. Another That's question right, yeah. came in, um, unique Cape Town activities, you know, apart from the sort of peninsula and the wine lands, are there other unique activities that we can you know, recommend for people in the Cape Town area? You know, we've got a very nice um, selection of, of, of different programs. I mean, depending on what uh, the specific interest might be, I mean, one can do um, the cult cultural side of things that, that I alluded to earlier. I mean, you go spend a half day um, in one of the, the local um, township areas outside of Cape Town. You can do a lovely, um, um, uh, sidecar adventure where you go along the Atlantic seaboard and uh, along Chapman's Peak. You can do, um, you know, you can do kayaking trips around the penguins um, in, at Boulder's Beach. You can go out and do uh, chocolate tastings and uh, and fun things out in the wine country. Um, so there are many different options. You know, you've got some amazing um, art and history. Um, in Cape Town, uh, you know, going into District 6, um, you've got uh, places um, in Franschhoek and, uh, and, and Stellenbosch, if you think in terms of Dylan Lewis and some of uh, the sculptures that uh, he's got on his property. You know, there are a great many different uh, um, options that one can design, depending on what the, the specific interest might be. Uh, you've got uh, botanical tours. You know, we do some lovely private home garden tours uh, for certain of our clients. Uh, we can do cooking classes, you know, if that's something that perhaps interests clients. So really, once we've got a fix as to what their particular interest is, we can design something very special. And, and we've got guides, you know, that um, if clients are, have got a, an interest in, in outdoor activities, if they want to go walking or cycling on the peninsula, we've got, we've got guides that are, that are, are specialists in those uh, particular interests as well. So once we know what they like, we can, we can tailor it to that specific client. Yeah, I agree with you. I think the, the, the bigger challenge we have sometimes is convincing a client to spend more time in Cape Town. I mean, you can literally spend 10 days there and not run out of things to do. And, you know, four nights is kind of a nice sweet spot, giving people time to do things. But if they want to do the shark diving, if they want to do something more, uh, I quite often recommend adding another night or two. Or if you love the wine country and I will say with all of us pent up at home, seeing those pictures of the food in the wine country kind of really made me dream of getting back to Cape Town and 
especially with the exchange rate now. I mean, it's it probably costs a, a quarter or a third of what a, a meal of that caliber would be on our side here. Um, also wanted to mention the guides there. I mean, we have phenomenal guides in Cape Town. Every guide that I have come across, you know, across the board working with Trans Africa. Many of these guides have worked with us for many, many years and really are at the top of their game and can also hone in on any specific interest with that. Uh, there was a last question about a typical two week itinerary and, you know, in the interest of time, I see we're going on an hour. Um, I can, you know, put it out from my side as well. My typical sort of, if you have 10, 12 days in Southern Africa, the three major attractions remain safari, which is mostly the reason why people go to Africa. And then of course, Cape Town and Victoria Falls. So uh, and a nice basic itinerary would be, you know, four nights in Cape Town wine country, then spending sort of six nights on safari, at least split between two different places, two different ecosystems whether in South Africa, whether in Botswana, uh, Zambia, Zimbabwe also give you some slightly lower cost options uh, if Botswana is out of the price bracket. And then ending up at Victoria Falls for two or three days, that's one nice flow or doing the Cape Town safari and then ending up on the beach. So I hope that answered that question. I don't see any more other uh, questions coming in. Oh, hang on, there's one. Uh, can we show the devil's pool picture again? Oh, oh sure. You pick Brooke and I out of there. <laughs> 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 that is definitely, and, and I think, you know, this year too, like we heard so much about the falls drying up and this and that. And, and you know, the reality is that Victoria Falls have a low water season, which happens to be my favorite time. This picture was taken late in November. Um, or actually could be the first day in December, we were over Thanksgiving period there with our friends. And, you know, it's a lovely experience. In reality, when the falls run completely full and it's a mile wide, there's so much water falling into that chasm behind us there that you get so much yeah. spray. Like it's impressive and it's the, I mean, it makes the hair on your neck stand up like the thunder of the water, but it is also hard to take pictures. You know, you get drenched from all that spray. And in the lower uh, water levels, like here, where you still have the falls running behind us and behind that next little island is the main part of the cataract on the Zim, Zim side, you can still have fantastic viewing of the falls. And if I go back and having been there a couple of times, you know, different times of the year, and I look at my favorite pictures of Victoria Falls, they're all from the low water season. So there's never really a wrong time to go to Victoria Falls. And in the low water season, the other thing that is a highlight for many people is the whitewater rafting. I do believe it's arguably the best one day whitewater raft you can do anywhere in the world on nice warm water. We did that with our friends the other day after we were in the pool here. And to this day, it's a highlight. I mean, I was in one of their homes the other day and there's a picture on the mantelpiece from our rafting trip. So yeah, definitely a, a, a gorgeous time to visit. Um, and then there's a question that came in around Devil's Pool. Do you think rates will rise next year to make up for lost revenue this year? Um, Andre, you can probably answer that as well. From my side, I have seen many uh, entities holding next year's rates. And if there are increases, it tend to be uh, slightly, you know, smaller. We haven't seen major, long, big, huge, big increases. Uh, I suspect if the RAND stays uh, weaker, some of the South African lodges may try to compensate and, and move it up so it's kind of roughly similar in the dollar rate. And of course, this is an unusual time. We're seeing a lot of people postponing you know, their trips until next year, uh, which is what we encourage everyone to do because so much in Africa depends on that income. Not the lodge and the, and the profit from an hotel, but the schools, the, the, the feeding uh, schemes in the background, the conservation, the poaching, all of those things have to go on and have so much of it is funded from the tourism sector. And obviously everyone is trying to keep all of that going as much as possible. But because people are postponing into 2021, I'm also seeing space being an issue already. Um, 
you already had some bookings for 2021 on, on the books before COVID came out. And now there's a whole lot of people month by month, though know, they are postponing into that time period. So ironically for some booking, I was working with someone the other day for next September and we're already struggling with space, you know, and they, they kind of like had to move. So long, long answer to a, to a short question. I think it should, you know, stay reasonably similar or, very marginal increases. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's a pretty that's a pretty detailed response there, Johan. But I think exactly that. You know, it, they're either holding the prices. A couple have even uh, reverted back to 2019 rates. You know, I think in an in an effort to be uh, accommodating to to try and draw back uh, the business. But um, if there are increases, I think they're going to be they're going to be modest. I think nobody's um, going to be brave enough to. To go in with um, you know 10, 12, 15 percent increases, they'll be they'll be the side of 10 percent, 5 percent, those kind of increases. And along those lines, there's obviously going to be some values coming out. Uh, the smaller camps only have so many beds, but I, mean, I I would envision slightly larger entities or hotels may definitely come out with you know very good rates and attractions. You know, as a way once they have a better idea of when travel is open, what the business flow is, and if they have, uh, they may be able to offer closer in business and try to make up for the loss of this year more in, you know, running higher occupancies and perhaps, you know, uh, getting people to travel in the shoulder in lower seasons when there's traditionally yeah. more space. So with that, I want to thank Andre for staying up later in Cape Town and for joining us today with all of this. Uh, I'm always a phone call or an email away. Uh, the Zoom technology works pretty well nowadays for a meeting where we can also look and see each other and then screen share as needed. Um, so I'm very happy to do any of those until I can you know, be in front of you again. And even with clients, I mean, I think this is, you know, we all learn something out of these unusual circumstances. And one of the things may be, a slightly more efficient tool to bring us and the client and everyone together and actually see a face, you know. Uh, I can't wait to, you know, hug people again or raise a glass together and we'll get back there. You know, like we're all hanging in there, you know, we're all gonna ride this out and learn a few new tricks, you know, that can hopefully help us in the future to make life easier and to make things easier on all of us and to be more efficient. Because I always see our job is making selling Africa easy. There's so many variables, there's so many lodges, there's so many areas you can go to, there's so many seasons and animals moving around. And that's the stuff we keep you know, up to date with and any tools that, or tricks we can learn to, to make it easier on you to sell Africa, you know, hopefully that's a good silver lining that'll come out of this. And in the meantime, you know, thank you for your support over the years and over time. Um, oops. I just got another question coming in about COVID in South Africa. I don't know where that one came from. Yes, um, you know, at the moment we're in, we in lockdown. Um, we've been in lockdown for, uh, since the tail end of March, 20, 26th of March. Um, and uh, we wait, we're waiting for an address this evening by our president to find out whether the lockdown is going to end at the end of April. Um, or whether there'll be uh, limited um, access back to work for, for many industries. So, you know, we've been uh, fairly fortunate. I think uh, our president was very cautious, very conservative. He got in with, um, with quite strict 100% uh, lockdown, except for essential services, right from the get-go when there was, uh, when the first um, uh, COVID cases um, were, 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 were picked up. And, um, our cases have really been uh, very modest. We've had a, we're sitting at about three and a half thousand um, infections, quite a few recoveries. We've got 50 odd deaths and um, it's not picking up and you know, the numbers aren't doubling the way this thing has typically taken off. So I think uh, to a great degree, it's been the fact that uh, we have stayed home and uh, we've done all the, the social distancing and the, and the good hygiene. And we just hope, you know, that that is going to um, that is going to be maintained going forward because there's not a question of uh, 
there's no doubt that when the lockdown ends, it's not a question of going back and uh, going back to the way we were. I think uh, there are going to be pockets of, of outbreaks and, you know, this thing's going to flare up and uh, it's going to be up to all of us uh, to behave responsibly, responsibly and to ensure that uh, the levels stay manageable and uh, are contained. Quick question as well, uh, SAA liquidating, uh, do we feel that a new national carrier will quickly form within the next 12 months or that there's others who can take up the slack on that? You know, I think uh, it's difficult to say at the moment. I mean, they, 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 they trying to resuscitate this airline now for quite some time and um, it's under uh, business business rescue and uh, they they've been declined money from the government uh, obviously in these tough times there's no money to be to be throwing on bailouts for the airline so i think um, it's hard to know but i think there's a very good uh, chance that they they may not um continue to be and i don't know that um in the in the short term there's going to be anybody plugging that gap but certainly We've got very good uh, um, domestic carriers. Um, we've got a lot of international carriers, so there's not going to be a problem in terms of uh, of access. I think those routes will be will be filled um, quite quickly, and you know, time will tell. Maybe there will be a a, a private um, partnership to try and um, uh, restart um, a national carrier. Good. Yeah, I mean, I, I I do feel that when the demand is there, something will fill the gap. You know, so you know, and their assets, I mean, the, the, the infrastructure and those kind of things will most likely just get taken over. You know, like a company here, you kind of get rid of all the debt, it gets taken over by a private entity and hopefully, you know, run better. Yeah. Uh, quick question, uh, one was, do we plan safaris in East Africa? I'll just answer that, yes, we do. And next week this time, we will be talking about East Africa. I'll walk you through Kenya, Tanzania, and, and Andre will focus a little bit on Rwanda. So tune in next year, this or oh, next week this time, and we can do a little bit more on East Africa. And let me see what else. Um, there's a question that's Kakuza is closed indefinitely. Any guess to when it will reopen? You know, there, there isn't. I think uh, we'll probably have a better indication tonight once we've uh, had the presidential address as to um, what, the, what the future is going to hold. But um, there's certainly been some suggestions that uh, you know, the, um, the airline side of uh, business is not going to be up and running um, from the get-go. So I suspect it'll still be a while that um, we're going to have um, um, uh, travel restrictions domestically and obviously internationally as well. But um, yeah, I can't answer that right now, but we'll, we'll have indication over the next month or so, I'm sure. Great, and a quick question again on Victoria Falls, uh, the property on the water near Vic Falls that was in the presentation. I believe that was Sindabisi, a little island yes. in the middle of the river that I also do a lot of work with and represent. Uh, there's a number of smaller properties up and down the river, uh, some lovely ones, some, uh, you know, very well-known ones, some that belong to you know, wilderness safaris, African bush camps, Tongabizi that I work with is one of my favorites as well. Royal Chundu further up the river, uh, Matetsi on the, on the uh, Zimbabwe side and a couple of other smaller ones there. So gorgeous properties. That's my favorite thing to do. You know, the big hotels are, you know, big hotels. Um, yeah. I like the Vic Falls Hotel. It's lovely to go have afternoon tea there. And, you know, it's the 120 year history and everything like that. But it's lovely to be 20, 30, 40 minutes up the river just where there's more elephants and animals coming down and you're away from the helicopters over the falls and close enough to run in and, and go and see and do all the activities there. But then sort of pulling back, um, most of the smaller lodges will take you out in a little boat and for sunset cruises, where obviously from the hotels and towns, you have more larger, almost barge like, you know, uh, you know, 100, 150 people on a boat versus, you know, you uh, or two couples or something like that. And having sundowners on a sandbar in the middle of the river, some of those moments you will always uh, remember. And another one is meals. Uh, what type of meals are available? Vegan, gluten-free, kosher, etc. I know from the safari lodge side, 
basically you know, we most cater to North Americans and to Europeans. There's never a day without a vegetarian in camp. My wife, Brooke, uh, is gluten-free because of celiac and, you know, we've experienced ease in travel in Africa. I mean, the food, the level of, of quality of food is, is so high. So vegan and gluten-free, those things are very, very easy to deal with. And um, Andre, perhaps you can enlighten us a bit on kosher. Uh, no, again, I think um, you yeah, provided some of some of the uh, lodges certainly can accommodate it. Certainly in the cities, you know, you, you won't have a problem providing uh, kosher meals. Um, but all we need is is obviously advanced knowledge, and we do send um, prior to uh, clients traveling. We send through a, um, uh, a food questionnaire, and you know from that we'll pick up any dietary requirements or any special needs. So. If we know in advance, I think all the lodges, all the hotels, um, you know, they, they're very in tune with working with the North American market and they can accommodate pretty much every request. So as long as we advise them ahead of time, they can make provision for that. Okay, uh, quick question to, uh, do we handle Inter-Africa Air? Yes, we do. Uh, we can take care of your clients from the second they set foot in Africa to when they hug and say goodbye and leave. So we handle all of that from start to finish. And it's, I actually prefer it that way because that, you know, if a flight change or something, you know, we're right on top of it. But even if you book some of the, the scheduled flights, like let's say add on the flight to Victoria Falls in a Boeing, you know, to their international ticket, because sometimes it saves a bit of money, we will still be on top of those flights as it is. Um, another question, do you suggest Botswana, then Namibia, or the other way around? Um, I personally think it's a, almost a flip of the coin, uh, because they're such different destinations um, that complement each other really well, that sort of what we all call the desert and delta safari. Um, many people will start off in Namibia, you move around a little bit more, be a bit more active and then end up in, Victor, uh, in Botswana and then quite often in Victoria Falls, so sort of like the last leg of that since you're in that neighborhood. But you can really do it the other way around as well. And people also combine a week in Namibia with, you know, Cape Town and you know, maybe start in Cape Town, go up to Namibia and then fly via Johannesburg to the Sabi Sands area. Uh, for me in that Southern Africa milieu, the, the, the Sabi Sands area is, you know, arguably, probably anywhere in Africa, one of the best places to see the big five in the shortest amount of time. If that's, you know, part of your goal of being in Africa and maybe in, on your first visit. Um, I always say if someone comes to me and say I'm flying from here to Australia in a private jet and I'm flying the other direction and I can land in Africa for three nights, where am I going to see the most safari, you know, a number of different species in that short two, three, four night stay, you're probably going to send them to the Sabi Sand. So that's also a nice one to, to weave in with that and works uh, together. And I think um, I've got a, a couple of uh, questions with maps and the likes, and I will uh, answer those, you know, individually and, and get it back to you as well. And the last question was, are lodges operating now, which is no, the country's in lockdown, uh, most of the African countries, and are they refunding trips this summer? Um, I think most of us have been trying to postpone and get clients to postpone, and Andre can perhaps end up on that in this unusual time. Yeah, you know, exactly as Johan says, I mean, where, where possible, um, We've uh, been working with the suppliers and working with the agents and their clients to to try and reschedule the trip because obviously that's in the best interest of the um, of everyone. I mean, you keep your commission. We obviously still handle the booking, the, the lodges and the hotels uh, get get the business. But um, there have been instances, you know, for whatever reason, where clients are unable to travel um, beyond whatever period was booked. And um, you know, depending where they are in terms of um, the booking, um, time-wise, um, most of the properties have been well. You know, they vary from property to property. It's got to be handled on a case-by-case -case basis. But um, we certainly endeavour to try and 
work uh, with you to to get as much um, of a refund as we can. Uh, there are obviously certain um, monies that may not be refundable, but uh, we've got to review it on a on a on a specific case basis, and we do work with you to try and secure as best a, um, a refund for your clients as possible. Fantastic. And yeah, and that's, that's the whole thing about having a, a professional respected team that's been around for a hundred years and have deep relationships running with different properties. You know, it's not a, we're not a new entity that's just coming into the market and have to prove ourselves. You know, we, we've got really, really deep running, long running uh, relationships and, you know, can help, you know, we are beholden to property, uh, terms and conditions as well to a certain extent but you know we we do work very very hard on behalf of clients to try and make this whole transition period as painless as possible so thank you again for tuning in um i will send you follow-up i'll even send a link uh, to this once the the recording is processed and uh, join us next week for a little look at east africa and again thank you so much for your time uh, we're Thank you very much and stay well and stay healthy and we hope uh, we get through this, uh, this and out the other side quick, fairly quickly. Take care, everyone. Perfect. Thank you so much.